High up in the Twin Towers overlooking Hong Kong Bay are the offices of Dr. Stanley Ho. Dr. Ho's fortune is estimated at more than $600 million in real estate, hotels and floating restaurants, commercial centers, an electronics firm, an air cargo company, a shipping company with 13 jet foils linking Hong Kong and Macau. But most of all, casinos. In Macau, on the other side of the Pearl River Delta, 60 kilometers from Hong Kong, Ho runs a gambling empire. A close friend of the governor's, Ho is feared and respected in the upper echelons of society. His home in Hong Kong is in one of the most exclusive and luxurious neighborhoods. Ho's story is of a revenge against the ill fortune that many years ago cast him and his family into disgrace and poverty. Now he travels only in Rolls Royces, and no social event would be complete without Stanley Ho as an honored guest. Stanley Ho is member of a powerful elite, one of the few men who has a say in the politics of Hong Kong. In society, he's often accompanied by his daughter, Pansy. Like most millionaires, Stanley Ho has considerable investments all over the world. In China, Stanley Ho is not Mr. Ho, but rather the king of Macau. Asian, charming, and rather British in his tastes, Stanley Ho reigns supreme over the gambling capital of Southeast Asia. His company has an estimated annual turnover of $5 billion, with profits estimated at $200 million a year. This powerful man, not content with merely being feared and respected, has received a long list of honors and awards. He's a member of the French Legion of Honor, a commander of the Order of St. John, has a doctorate in sociology and many other honorary degrees. All these titles are, for Stanley Ho, a sweet revenge, a way of winning back the honor and prestige once bestowed on his family. In 1941, during the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong, Stanley Ho discovered his master, money. He had escaped to Macau, 60 miles from Hong Kong, on the mouth of the Pearl River, one of the oldest European colonies in the world. Gambling started in Macau in 1860 as a temporary means of earning money to help out the economy of Timor, another Portuguese colony. The government of Macau took a certain percentage of the profits and in the following years, what had been temporary became permanent. In 1941, in Macau, the war raged, but in no way diminished the fever of gambling and business deals. Stanley Ho set about learning to live with the enemy. He fought like a tiger. He had nothing to lose, after all, and everything to gain. He waged his own private war. I would say that uh, the best opportunity in life is during the war years, where you really have good opportunities to, make a, to amass a fortune. Today, Stanley Ho enjoys telling the story of his adventurous life. Here in his sumptuous home in Hong Kong, he reflects on those momentous times. My mother, my father, my two uncles. Now, this is my granduncle. This is uh, the son of my granduncle, the general of Taiwan. Actually, 
all my father and uncles, they were sitting on the top of the Hong Kong. They were doing so well then. My father was the comprador of Sassoon's, which is a, a Jewish firm then, and again, also very prominent. What comprador really means is a Chinese manager who can speak English and help the English firm to trade in Hong Kong because most of the people, they all speak in Chinese. So this is the, the reason of engaging a comprador. The gods were smiling when Stanley Ho was born in 1921 in Hong Kong. His family was rich, venerable, respected. His father was the president of the Chinese Chamber of Commerce. His mother, half Portuguese, one of the most beautiful women in high society. During the 1929 stock market crash, Ho's family suffered catastrophic losses and went bankrupt. Dishonored, his father fled to Saigon and two of his uncles committed suicide. Stanley Ho and his mother were left in sudden poverty. With the help of scholarships, he graduated from Queen's College and later the University of Hong Kong. In the university, uh, there were many pretty girls and I wasn't so bad looking. So now and then the girls would uh, invite me for a cup of tea and naturally I'm expected to pay. So I had to find some excuse to uh, go to the toilet or somewhere and disappear. Very sad. And uh, in fact, I was studying very hard and uh, I tried to become a very good uh, scientist. Then suddenly the war came, the Japanese war. In my case, I uh, accepted to be a member of the Air Raid Warden's Office. So, you know, uh, we had eight days of war and after the war, when Hong Kong surrendered, I immediately threw away all my uniforms and uh, we must uh, try to find a way to uh, earn a living. And I happened to run into one uh, very kind uncle who offered me a job in Macau. So naturally, I uh, managed to escape to Macau and took refuge in Macau. Stanley Ho escaped by boat with only $10 in his pocket and the clothes on his back. The raging war troubled the once quiet inhabitants of the Portuguese colony. Macau's Chinese streets and Baroque churches offered an exotic and decadent atmosphere to the refugees pouring in from far and wide. This gambling town soon became a haven for foreign capital. With three years of chemistry studies behind him, Stanley Ho had no trouble finding a job. Japanese importers of flour and rice hired him as their secretary for about $50 a month. My job was not an easy one. And my three bosses liked me so much. After about one year, they made me uh, uh, small member of the company. So from that onwards, then I became a full partner. And finally, I, when the war came almost to the end, I became my own boss. It's a kind of a challenge, I think, because I was treated very badly by my other relatives. They would dodge me when they see me in the streets. They were afraid that I might go there and borrow money. So to show them, I can also be rich again. So uh, that was the challenge. My mother was still in Hong Kong uh, for two more years before I managed to help her to move over to uh, Macau to join me. She uh, became very ill and uh, I promised her, don't worry mother, one day I shall make good. I became a millionaire before she died. So I became a trader in many kinds of business. I was in import and export. I was in ship 
bricking business. I was in uh, industry. Oh yes, I, I was in many kinds of uh, business until I went into uh, real estate. When Ho returned to Hong Kong in 1946, after the departure of the Japanese, he found himself back again on English territory. Hong Kong, a small island with a foothold on the mainland of the southern tip of China, had been ceded to the British Lion, after the Opium Wars of the 19th century. It remains a British colony until 1997, when Hong Kong, like Macau two years later, will be returned to the Chinese. It was a grand era, when English businessmen made fortunes in trade through the intermediary of their trusted compradors, like Stanley Ho's venerable grandfather, Ho Fock. This era, which saw the creation of giant trading houses like Jardine Matheson and Sassoon's, is now coming to an end. The Chinese are no longer the go-betweens. They work for themselves and are now millionaires as well. Little by little, the English have eased their political and economic control of the colony, much to the benefit of the local businessmen, who've taken advantage of the influx of thousands of refugees fleeing communist China. Refugees forced to work for poor wages and in desperate need of housing. Dollars and profit are magic words in Hong Kong to be found on everyone's lips which is perhaps why Hong Kong became such a major economic force in so short a time. But it's also thanks to the hordes of underpaid laborers crammed into ever more crowded tenements. The war over, Stanley Ho realized he had to diversify his investments. He built all sorts of low-income housing. The diversity of Hong Kong's buildings represents a veritable museum of contemporary urban architecture. The Chinese businessmen made fortunes, and as companies became more successful and wealthy, they demanded increasingly impressive buildings for their headquarters. This is certainly why Hong Kong now boasts such magnificent buildings, rivaling each other in splendor along its harbor. In Hong Kong, Stanley Ho took full advantage of the real estate boom during the 1950s to make his first fortune. But he hadn't quite finished with Macau. No doubt at the time, Mr. Ho hardly suspected that the biggest chance of his life was about to come his way. The break that was to make him a truly powerful man. In his office, he reminisces about this great opportunity. It started at the end of 61, actually. I was doing very well in the real estate field, and then I saw this tender for uh, the gambling franchise in Macau. And uh, having known all the Macau people during the three years of war, I uh, knew Macau very well, so I thought of putting in a tender. The motive was, Again, another challenge. The Chinese are very fond of gambling. I think it's in their blood. They all love to gamble, whether in the casinos or even outside the casino. Gambling is forbidden in Hong Kong except for betting on horses at the famous Hong Kong Jockey Club. The Hong Kong Chinese, passionate gamblers, cannot, however, 
at the horse races quite satisfy their urge for betting. So they resort to gambling in clandestine halls, flouting the law. Here in Aberdeen, the floating village of Hong Kong, refugees and fishermen are piled on top of one another. If you happen to climb onto one of the terraces of the two floating restaurants owned by Stanley Ho, you might just discover certain back rooms where stakes are rather higher than mere mahjong. But to play freely and openly, we have to go to Macau. Casinos have existed there for over a century and have made fortunes both for their owners and the Portuguese government, which of course takes its cut. And so has grown the legend of Macau, the gambling inferno. But times have changed, and gambling fever has lost its sleazy edge. Gambling in Macau is a Chinese affair. 10 million players, 80% of them from Hong Kong, come every year to test their luck at the tables. Baccarat is by far the most popular game, followed by blackjack and a few traditional Chinese games. Roulette, on the other hand, is not as popular as it is in Las Vegas or in Monte Carlo. With six casinos, of which five are open round the clock, Macau is one of the world's gambling capitals. From the popular floating casino to the VIP rooms in the Lisboa Hotel, gamblers of all levels take their pleasure. The players who come here are on serious business. They're not playing for fun. It's a need, a drug. When I first started, I was uh, uh, attacked, sort of, by uh, some uh, cheaters and gangsters from uh, American. American gangsters and cheaters. They came and I knew who they were, so I approached them, I say, please give me a chance. I've only started two, three months. Please go somewhere else. I uh, said, be my guest, you know. Please leave. That very evening, they uh, took about half a million dollars from the crab table. And that crab table, we didn't have any business more than maybe two, three thousand a night. So how could possibly I lose uh, half, half a million? I knew something was wrong. I was in Hong Kong. So I immediately, long distance, my brother who was in charge, I said, I'm afraid it could be loaded dice. So immediately they opened up the dice and found it to be loaded dice. So actually, we cannot arrest people unless they were caught in the red within the casino. But luckily with my connection with the police, the police chief was very sympathetic with me and they managed to detain them. So we detained in the history of Macau the first time five Americans. These poor Americans suffer so much from the rats because in the prisons of Macau, the rats are bigger than cats and bit off the ears and the toes of the Americans. And that was a bitter lesson. And I never had any more of these cheaters coming to me or gangsters. So now Macau is very peaceful. The old concessionaires were most nasty they threatened to arrange all the beggars to be uh, stationed at the front door of my casino. And then uh, at one stage, they actually stopped all their ferries, hoping that I could only bring my customers by junks to Macau. And fortunately, at that time, I was uh, uh, able to control one ferry, and I bought one hydrofoil, so one ferry and one hydrofoil fought them for about six months. And then they could see that they can't block me any longer. 
they in the end sold me all their things. I was the first one to introduce the hydropower service in Asia, the first person. And I think uh, now we are having uh, it like a bus service. From 7 a.m. in the morning through the night up to early hours in the morning, 3 a.m. So it's virtually like a 24-hour round-the-clock operation. We have now uh, 13 jet flights. One on the way from Japan, making it a total of 14. And these jet foils today are very costly. They are as costly as 1727 airline. It's over 20 million US dollars each. It's the fastest commercial craft on earth. And uh, you can get into Macau in less than one hour. Ladies and gentlemen, tickets for the Macau Instant Lottery Beat the Banker are now available for sale on this vessel. Each ticket costs five per ticket, and there are many chances to win the instant prizes. You can win up to 10,000 per ticket. This game is similar to the blackjack. First, scratch off the previous and the player's cards, one to four. If the total from any one of the player's cards beats that of the previous, you win. Good luck. What we see here is as nothing to the situation 50 years ago. And this was precisely Macau's problem. Silt deposits threatened to suffocate and permanently close its all-important harbor. In 1961, the Macau government decided to offer the casino concessions to anyone who could rid the port of its accumulating silt and reopen Macau's sea links to the rest of the world. And this is where Stanley Ho stepped in. In an act of engineering genius, he solved Macau's problem and launched himself on the path to enormous riches. There was, however, just one other problem to be solved. Macau was swamped with squatters from China. As one of our obligations is to clear the squatters, uh, oh, hundreds and hundreds of squatters, it took us 22 years to clear all these squatters because it's a social problem and it wasn't easy at all. But uh, finally, it's all clear now. And if you pass the outer harbor, you see a lot of new uh, buildings, high rises coming up. And it's going to be the new city of Macau. So in order to satisfy the customers of the casinos, we built many hotels. This marked the beginning of his reign as the king of Macau, the emperor of gambling. Ho has reason to be proud as he succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. From 500,000 players in 1960, Macau now welcomes more than 10 million a year. His success is perhaps due in part to the fact that Ho was wise enough, despite the modernization and construction, to preserve Macau's quiet Portuguese charm. A visit to Macau is like a holiday. What is the annual profit of the STDM? Well, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to disclose because uh, anything related with gambling, the, the government uh, wants me to keep it con confidential. Nowadays, how much does STDM pay the Macau government yearly? I can tell you, although I cannot release the figures, I can tell you that we contribute as much as 40% of the government's uh, revenue every year, 40%. How many people live in Macau and how many of them work for the STDM? Well now, directly I have about 4,500 employees. But indirectly, for instance, like uh, restaurants, taxis, shops, I would say uh, 
at least out of a population of uh, half a million, I can safely say that uh, maybe 30,000 people work directly and indirectly for the SDDM. 30,000 people plus 40 French girls, chosen exclusively by Stanley himself, doing their thing in the Lisboa cabaret. the casinos and other late-night pleasures viewed by the traditional Catholic population of Macau. In other times, the owner of all this would have been condemned by religious leaders to the flames of hell. Father Tashira, picturesque and famous local figure, lives alone in a large monastery. How does he see Stanley Ho and gambling today? Well, that question has been put to me by the fanatic Protestants, fanatics, that want my father, how can you support all these things? And I tell them, as I'm telling you, I'm not a, poli a policeman. I cannot take a revolver and kill all the gamblers and kill all the sinners. So if God feeds them and keeps them and gives them rain and, uh, and sun, well, I cannot do it otherwise, you know. I cannot do anything at all. So each one is free to do whatever he likes. Like these crazy horse girls, they are free to do whatever they like. What are your relations with Dr. Ho today? Oh, good, wonderful. Yesterday I saw him a little, you know, so I asked him, Stanley, why are you so, are you so nervous? You gave so many speeches in your life. Are you so nervous now to give a speech? No, Father, it's not, not that, because it's cold. So I'm cold and not nervous at all, you know, yesterday night, you know. Are you nervous? No, oh, I'm cold. A unique personage, Stanley Ho is a political institution in Macau. Not only a casino operator, He's also a shipbuilder. Indeed, in this rather old-fashioned territory, he's a benefactor. He and his sister, the director of his casinos, are, along with the governor, a part of every ceremony. In fact, it's usually they who sponsor the events. It was designed, built, and will be licensed in Macau. This is a sign of our confidence in the shipbuilding industry of Macau. At a time when people are talking about the loss of confidence in the future, our company is going exactly in the opposite direction. Thank you very much. So, Judiciary Domine, Explicaciones Nostris, Ed Benedict, he came to Macau from Hong Kong with 10 Macau patacas in his pocket. 10 Macau patacas. Now he wins more than a billion patacas. So that means well, he's a very clever man, especially for business. He's, he, he has done very well. Do you have plans for new developments in Macau? Well, now, as I said earlier, we uh, also are interested in infrastructures jointly with the Macau government. Because again, like for instance, the building of an airport will help us to get the, uh, the cream from the tourist. Because at the moment, when the tourists arrive from Hong Kong, they are either uh, half emptied their pockets or maybe uh, left with very little to spend in Macau. So once we have our own airport, uh, we can get, hopefully, uh, customers directly from Bangkok, 
from Singapore, Malaysia, Manila, Taipei. Excuse me. Wait, wait. Hey. Sorry, Fong. Can. Since the end of the 1960s, Ho has made the greater part of his fortune in Macau. But he runs his business from Hong Kong, where he has his home and office. Stanley Ho, with his gift for business, is an inspiration to the upwardly mobile youth of Hong Kong. I'm a fighter, I admit, and I had luck, I had luck. Uh, I'm the type that I will never admit defeat until I really lose. So I will always try and try again and again, and I will never accept no for an answer. Not so easy. When you say no, I will say, wait, I, please uh, listen some more, and I still try to fight. I have... Uh, learned from uh, one of my bosses when I first started in business in Macau. And he said, Stanley, uh, God is very fair. He will always give one or two or more opportunities to every person in life, to all walks of life. So really, if you know how to grab that opportunity, uh, then you will climb up. And then as you climb, if you are clever enough, you continue to climb. Personally, I uh, told uh, young people who ask me what they should do in life, I always tell them that the element of luck is not all that much for normal people. Really, I don't believe the element of luck is all that much. Uh, it's more important for them to work hard and uh, really to be able to sacrifice that their time sometimes uh, for business sake. Stanley Ho is the president of the Real Estate Investors Association of Hong Kong. He owns two magnificent buildings along the bay, one of which contains his offices, ferry terminals, and a large shopping mall, the Shun Tak Center. The other houses a luxury hotel, the Victoria. The extraordinary density of this city, with six million inhabitants, more than 5,000 people per square kilometre, is the only real social problem in Hong Kong. But despite the fact that space is both severely limited and at a premium, he continues to build, destroying where necessary, remaining traces of the old colonial days. To service his jet foils, he has a maintenance company and a company that builds floating restaurants and casinos for export. King of land and of sea, Stanley Ho has recently bought 50% of an air cargo company, Air Hong Kong, which will soon be expanded to carry passengers. If we add up the revenues of Stanley Ho's two principal companies, Shun Tak and STDM, we come to a figure of 450 to 500 billion dollars a year. Ho's personal profit is estimated at one-tenth of this sum. Hong Kong is capitalist in the true sense of the word. To understand Hong Kong's economic boom of the last 20 years, we must meet Simon Murray, General Director of Hutchison's, the largest company in Hong Kong, which belongs to another Chinese tycoon, Li Ka Shing. In the beginning, the absence of government interference and heavy handedness with business has been um, has provided a platform. Uh, that, that allows businessmen to operate without interference. The absence of politicians and so on is also, there's a plus in there. The location of Hong Kong, its proximity to China, has enabled the China trade side to develop over the years. Um, Hong Kong's proximity to Japan, its, its location vis-a-vis uh, -vis Southeast Asia, this magnificent harbor that we have, probably the best harbor on the whole of the South China, China coast, 
Innovation by the individuals, of course, has been a big factor, but it's really the environment. The Chinese themselves, the industriousness of the people here, the, the work ethic, uh, many of them are refugees. Refugees are motivated in a way uh, rather different to, to people who have more affluence. There's that need to succeed. It's not greed for money, it's m the requirement for money as, as a security base that uh, motivates them. In public companies, we are governed by um, requirements of the Hong Kong government and, of course, the stock exchange and, and, and so on. And I think our practices are very similar to those in London and America. And I think we're, in, we're trying to uh, improve those practices to provide more information to the investing uh, public and so on. And that process is an ongoing process. And many of the property companies that have emerged over the last 15 years are all Chinese-dominated Sun Hung K properties and so on. Stanley Ho has properties all over Hong Kong and businesses all over Ma Macau. So that the Chinese uh, businessman, by and large, he is secretive. He depends to a very great extent on personal contacts and trust and uh, loyalties and, 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 and things like that. Um, whereas, and, and of course, he is much more inclined to be an owner of the business, um, whereas your uh, British or, or European or American uh, business may have a much, much wider uh, shareholder base and is not necessarily the, 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 um, the business of, of one single, single person. Today I have uh, some power in Macau, I can say, some in Hong Kong, but uh, when I was young, in order to fulfill my uh, obligations, in order to meet the challenges, uh, money making seemed uh, most important in my life. But it's no longer the case now. I think I've made enough, and now it's time for me to start giving it back to where I made them. <laughs> Well, I am uh, an actor tonight for charity because uh, in Hong Kong we all support the community chest. So the community chest this time have picked me to be one of the actors in a very uh, old uh, Chinese uh, picture. Well, the skit is about the house of 72 tenants. Where were the tenants of this big house? And a man suddenly comes in who's lost his memory. And he happens to be the owner of the house. But he's lost his memory because of a car accident. And we're very nice to him, and he's very happy living in this poor house. I'm the owner. And uh, I just issued a, a notice to get rid of them for redevelopment. But when I got to know them, while well, I've lost all my memory, I found them very agreeable, so we became friends. By the time I woke up, then I realized that after all they are so friendly, I just let them carry on. I will develop somewhere instead. <laughs> Social life in Hong Kong is very hectic. And all these parties, if you don't go, and uh, with my status today, they will say, oh, you don't give me face, so, you know. In the end, you have to attend nearly every party. And some of these parties are very dull, very, very dull. Stanley Ho has not only come back with a vengeance in the world of business, he's also succeeded in winning back the honorable position held by his family before their downfall. Social events are therefore part of Ho's busy calendar, practically as important as his business meetings. 
At all grand occasions, he's received as a guest of honor. In Hong Kong, the most elegant soirees are the charity balls and galas, where the women of high society take the opportunity to show off their most expensive dresses and jewels. French designers are preferred, such as Dior, Saint Laurent, Givenchy. Tonight, it's a Nina Ricci fashion gala, thrown by the Princess Masha Magalov. Ho, as always, is accompanied by his daughter Pansy, businesswoman and a director of the television station, ATV. Pansy doesn't want to succeed her father. Indeed, none of Stanley Ho's eight children has been groomed to take over the business. They're well off and secure and have a rather carefree attitude about the fate of Hong Kong in 1997, when the colony will come once again under communist rule. They take life as it comes, and luxuriously at that, content to regularly appear in the local social columns. Some of this fashionable elite show their wealth more than others. One extravagant case of exhibitionism is Brenda Chow, better known as the Pink Lady, who had her portrait made in rare Chinese pearls. I must say, I'm very lucky, and so is my husband. And our parents are rich, uh, yes. And uh, we are lucky to be able to born in the, um, you know, to have uh, rich parents. So our lifestyle has always been more or less the same. When we were younger, although our parents had money, but um, they were different from us. They are like the other Chinese people. They only know, they only knew how to work, 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 and then that they don't uh, enjoy life as what we make out now. The reason I buy these Rolls Royces is not because they are British cars, not at all. I find their styles are very elegant and stylish, that's all. I think uh, each one is for a different occasion. And then the other one is a beige color one, and that can uh, match all my dresses, you know, any, because it's a very neutral color and can go with the, uh, most of my dresses. Do you think that there's something about Hong Kong that makes making money easy? What is it about Hong Kong that allows for success? Uh, well, there has been a lot of success being achieved in Hong Kong, especially uh, through business and industry. Uh, I think because of its background, the, tech, the taxation is comparative low uh, when it's compared with other countries and also uh, money freely can go in and out of Hong Kong. Uh, we hope we will re uh, we can retain our own lifestyle, but I think more or less we expect some changes in 1997. 1997. This is the date when Hong Kong, in accordance with the treaty between Great Britain and China, will revert to Chinese rule, as will Macau in 1999. Deng Xiaoping has promised that for 50 years, Hong Kong and Macau will retain the capitalist system. I think uh, what I have promised China at the moment is to continue to invest heavily in Hong Kong and Macau to show that we have confidence in the future of these two territories. As for mainland China itself, I always feel that I should, uh, as a Chinese, contribute more than I should invest. Because your homeland is so poor and I don't uh, like to make too much money out of them. The Chinese have been in Macau for some time. The border is in the town itself and people and goods are free to cross it at will. They've reached a sort of peaceful stalemate.
Quite apart from Stanley Ho's affairs, the Chinese communists dominate a good part of the Macau economy through controlling interests in major banks. Control which remains in principle secret. Only the Bank of China operates openly. In Hong Kong also, the Chinese have an economic foothold with all sorts of financial and real estate investments. Every day they are becoming more um, uh, visible in Hong Kong. So they have property in Hong Kong, they have investments in our airlines, Cathay Pacific, they have 12% of that. They have investments in our telephone companies, uh, many of our public companies and, and so on. So uh, they have the, the Bank of China operates a, a, a great number of um, branches here in, in Hong Kong. So every aspect of Hong Kong business, mainland Chinese, is in there, like everybody else, batting away and making money. In Hong Kong, even the famous and very British Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, pride of the architectural avant-garde, has been dwarfed by the stunning edifice of the new Bank of China, designed by the world-renowned Chinese-American architect I. M. Pei. In Canton, 300 kilometers from Hong Kong, along the Pearl River in communist China, conferences on the future statutes of Hong Kong and Macau are held periodically in the old neighborhood of international concessions. The representatives from Peking discuss the situation with those businessmen whom they consider to be the most important in the economic future of the two territories. Stanley Ho is one of the favorites among them. He had the foresight to get into their good books by investing financially in projects they held dear, without asking anything in return. The Chinese were kind enough to include entertainment as one of the main items in the uh, basic law. And they, many of the leaders, told me, uh, Stanley, you may continue with your casinos uh, for another 50 years from 1999, meaning they also realize that it is virtually impossible to replace gambling uh, with some other uh, kinds of uh, industry. As long as they don't interfere with the administration, as promised, they promise uh, self-government to us, 50 years unchanged, with the capitalist society, then I reckon Hong Kong shall continue to prosper. Now that he's assured the future of his children and restored his family name to honor, Stanley Ho is peaceful, no longer revengeful. His empire is secure, thanks to its diversity. Hotels in South Korea, casinos and hotel complexes in Portugal, Australia, Spain, Jakarta. In Toronto, he's developed the colossal electronics firm Semitech, a company with an annual turnover of well over $500 million. I don't wet my hair. At peace, he can now turn to other things, like his physical condition. I play tennis every other day. I swim every day, even for 20 minutes, and I go out shooting once a week. When I was all for making money, at the age between uh, 20 to 40, I was quite fat. Oh yes, at one, at one time, I was nearly 200 pounds. I had back trouble, big stomach, not elegant at all. But then, after 40, I decided that I must uh, give some time to my figure. I must think of my health. I'm a fairly good dancer, and I love dancing now and again. If there's any ball or any parties like that, I would dance away. I have uh, eight children, one son and uh, seven daughters. I think uh, Pansy well, she's, uh, resembles me a lot, even in appearance. She's uh, now in the 
social society. Yes, I'm proud of her. I always impress on my children that it's no good for me to leave them all the fortunes, money. Uh, it's the education that counts in life. Because if a person is wealthy and he's not educated, what's the use of the money? The most uh, successful day in my life is when I uh, managed to win the uh, gambling concession. Turn of my life started with that. Stanley Ho has one great dream left, to turn Hong Kong into the Asian headquarters of the United Nations, to construct a building that would house its offices, much as another tycoon, Rockefeller, did in New York. I rarely dream, says Ho, but this dream keeps coming back. I can still afford to enjoy sports, still enjoy dancing, company of beautiful women. Yes, my dream now is to live a little longer. You find a love you can share. What you can do for your Oh.